So we're going to discuss, because I get this question all the time, you know, and you probably do as well. Um, everybody wants to know, what are my closing costs going to be? And whenever somebody says, what are my closing costs going to be, one of the first things that I like to ask them is, tell me what your expectation is of what you're going to owe at closing. And because closing costs are just one component. So what I want to ask, first question is, what are the expenses that someone has at closing? There's five. Potentially, there's five. What are those expenses that they're going to have at closing? What can you tell me? Attorney fee rolls into one of the five. You're correct. What's that? Recording. That rolls into one of the five. Taxes. What's that? Taxes. Taxes. Well, yes. Can you be more specific? Because that rolls into one of the five. It depends on what time of the year it is. Ah, we'll talk about that in a moment. It does if you're doing a refinance. It doesn't if you're doing a purchase. Five things people owe at closing. First one. their down payment, or should we say the balance of their down payment? Because if they put in the earnest money, which they do, then that earnest money is going to be applied to what they owe at closing. All right. So if down payment is one of the five things that they have to have at closing, give me something else. Insurance? I'm sorry? Insurance prepaid. You are so, so close. That is part of one of the five. Escrow. There we go. Escrows. Escrows. And there are two things that go into escrows, which we've just heard somebody talk about. You've got homeowners insurance. And you have taxes. OK. What about HOA fees? Thank you. Who said that? Me? Way to go, Jasleen. <laughs> HOA is one of the five. Two left. One of them is a big one that you started to mention, but you put, instead of calling it what it is, you started putting certain things in it. Okay, let me just make it. This is the this is where it gets tricky. Closing costs. And you've already started to mention some of them, recording fees, attorney's fees, title insurance, blah blah blah. The last one somebody started, I forget maybe it was I don't know who it was exactly, but you mentioned homeowners insurance. Well, Homeowners insurance classifies as something called prepaids. And there are two prepaid items, sometimes a third one. Prepaid is um, first year whoop, homeowners insurance and um, interest to interest for the month. Okay, those are our five things that you've got to have at closing. So people will call me and they'll say, well, Greg, I, I was told I should compare closing costs. And I'll say, OK, fine. You want to compare closing costs. What about the other items that are due at closing? And when I say that, and I'm not exaggerating when I give you my next number, 100% of the time, 
when they asked me, well, I was told I should check on what my closing costs are going to be, I, I just ask them a question. What about the other items that you will owe at closing? And they say, I don't know what you mean. Now, if somebody asks you about closing costs, or if you're suggesting check with the lenders about closing costs, and they call me up with that question, I ask them the question, what about the other items due at closing? What do you, what do you think they're thinking? Is there something else somebody didn't tell me about? And so you don't want that to be the case if you're the one that's their trusted advisor. So when their parents are asking them about closing costs and they say something to you about closing costs, you can just ask them, well, what about the other items at closing? And they now look at you and say, well, I don't know what, you're, what, what, what are the other items. All of a sudden, you are now what? The trusted advisor, at least a little bit more, because you're going to give them information they don't know about. Five things do at closing. First one is the balance of the down payment, right? Whatever it was, whatever the down payment is. Now, this used to be very simple. Why is this not so simple today? Anybody? The down payment. What's that? You're asking about the down payment. The down payment. Why is the down payment not just a simple calculation today? What's changed in the market that makes the down payment potentially a variable? No, not so much type of loan, but appraisal, uh, what are they called, appraisal gaps. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that if you wrote an offer for $300,000 and you were going to put 10% down, you would come to closing with $30,000 minus whatever your earnest money was, right? Now today you put an offer in and you put an offer in for $325,000, but you are advising your client, and your client's aware. We don't know if it's going to appraise for 325. It might only appraise for 310. And you've said that you'll pay $15,000 over the appraisal. But your down payment to the lender is based on the lesser of the contract sales price or the appraised value. So if my appraised value comes in at 310,000, and I'm putting 10% down, that's $31,000. But you put an appraisal gap in there of 15,000, so now you don't have 31,000 coming to closing, you have 46,000 you're bringing to closing, right? Make sense or did I lose you? Okay, so down payment used to be simple, simple. Whatever you said you're gonna put down, 3%, 5%, 20%, whatever it was, today, we don't even know what that amount's going to be until the appraisal comes in because you're putting in these huge appraisal gaps. Right? So this is, an important, this is more important today that you and I have the discussion with the borrower about how much money they will need at closing. I have a lady this weekend who wrote an offer. She wants to put 10% down. But what we did, myself and the agent and her had a call on Saturday, and what we structured for her was an appraisal gap of up to 5% of the contract sales price. And the reason that we did that is I showed her what the payment would look like if it was a 5% down versus 10. She's prepared to put 10% down, but she really wants this house. So I said, well, you can put down 10%, but what, what if you have to pay over because the appraisal doesn't come in? So what we did is we structured it so there's 5% available for her if that happens. So if the appraisal comes in low, instead of her putting a down payment of just 5% of the appraised value, or 10% of the appraised value, she's going to put 5%. We saved the other 5% in case she needs it for the appraisal gap. If she doesn't need it for the appraisal gap, then she'll put 10% down. No big deal. So there are ways that you can help people out with this number here so that it makes it more feasible for them to not only put in a stronger offer, 
but to be able to afford to put in that stronger offer and not come out of pocket with more money. Now, where this becomes difficult on your appraisal gaps is if somebody's only, only has 3% or 5% down. They don't have any more money for down payment. Then the appraisal gap becomes much more difficult. But if they're putting down 10 or 15 or 20, you can deal with it. All right, any questions on that before I go on? Okay, closing costs. Now, you've already mentioned there's a whole bunch of things that roll up into closing costs. I mean, the lender junk fees, the um, attorney's fees, the title, um, you're gonna have to have all the title work done, the title insurance for both the lender and the, and the homeowner. Um, and is everybody aware that title insurance, lender's title insurance is required, owner's title insurance is optional? Now, most everybody takes owner's title insurance anyway, but just aware, that one is an optional item. All your recording fees, the state intangible tax, the state um, transfer tax, the cost of an appraisal, cost of a credit report. Now, let me ask a question. From lender to lender to lender, if you just took 10 lenders and you gave them a contract, you gave them a binding contract, and you said, I want to know the difference from all 10 lenders. I want you to see what your, forget about this stuff. I want, to see the, I want to see what your closing costs are. What do you think the maximum difference will be from one lender to the next? Highest and lowest, what do you think it might be? It's not a trick question. What's that? Assuming no origination fee. Assuming no origination fee. The actual closing costs. Within $500. $500. Anybody else? Dwayne is, Dwayne, is, Dwayne is just about right on target. I mean, that's the number I give people, Dwayne. So, you know, you, you cheat because you were in the lending business. <laughs> so here's, here's what happens on closing costs. People think that there's this gigantic difference in closing costs. But think about it. You give a lender, you give me a contract, and in the contract on page one, you're telling us where you're gonna close the loan, is that correct? Luder Larkin, right? O'Kelly and Sarhan, Wiseman, you're telling us, the lender, where it's closing. So if you think about it once, the attorney's fees, the title search, title exam, recording fees, lender's title insurance, owner's title insurance, six of the biggest items that are going to appear on, that are part of closing costs, are going to be identical from lender to lender to lender because you've told us where we are ordering, where we're gonna close the loan, right? So six of the items in closing costs are identical. And that's not really true, it's eight. Why? Because does the state intangible tax and state transfer tax change if you go to a different lender? No. So there's eight things that are identical. So what are the only possibilities that could be different? The first one is the lender junk fees. That's what Dwayne was talking about when he said $500. The lender junk fees. Every lender charges, they don't they hate when I call them junk fees, but that's what they are. Um, but every lender charges junk fees. The lowest I've seen is $895. The most expensive I've seen is $2,000 someplace in that ballpark. Ours are $1,275, $1,275. Where do you get a loan for a million or you get a loan for 100,000? At my bank, you pay 1275, period. Most lenders are gonna be within $500 of one another on their junk fees. Then you have to pay for an appraisal, a credit report, uh, the GR GRMA fee, which is a whopping $10. That's the same for everybody. Your appraisal, appraisal could be anywhere from 450 to maybe 550, so maybe $100 difference, maybe. Credit reports usually run between 35 and 40 bucks. So from lender to lender to lender to lender to lender, does it pay to have somebody spend two hours on the telephone finding out what closing costs are? Not at all. Why? Because they're gonna be the same. 
And if somebody says to me, well, why are they the same? I just go back and say, because you're telling me where I'm closing that loan. And those six items you dictated were not me. So closing costs are almost the same. Prepaids. Who picks out the homeowner's insurance? The buyer. So is that going to change from lender to lender to lender? No, it's going to be identical. Because you're picking it out, you're telling us where we're going to go. Interest for the remaining part of the month. So if you close on the 25th, that means, and if it's 31 days, I'm going to have six days of interest. Close on the 15th, I'm going to have 17 days of interest. Every lender is going to have 17 days of interest, or six days of interest, or whatever it is. And the only possible change, if one lender's an eighth difference in the rate, it might be a few dollars. We're talking five dollars, maybe, difference. So for all practical purposes, prepaids are going to be what? For every lender. They're going to be the same. There's no difference. Now, escrows. Every lender, unless you waive escrows, which means 20% down or more, unless you waive escrows, and we don't waive many escrows anymore, but you can uh, in some cases. But escrows involve two things, homeowner's insurance and taxes. Homeowner's insurance was established by the borrower. Property taxes are established by who? What's that? Well, the county, county or city because this is property taxes, not income taxes, but they determine it. The government, the government does. You're exactly right, the government does. So here's the interesting thing about escrows. Lenders are not allowed to randomly pick how much they want to put into the escrow account. We're not allowed to. There is a federal formula that every, it's called an aggregate adjustment because what happens is you put in the numbers in the, in the program and it spits back how much you can put in escrow based on how much are the homeowner's insurance and how much are taxes per month. You plug that information in and it tells you how much you can do. Every lender uses exactly the same formula. So if we're all using the same formula issued by the government, how much different will this one be from lender to lender to lender? Not at all. It's going to be identical. It's the same thing. Now, how many times have you had a buyer show you two different closing uh, or loan estimates? And one loan estimate has got the total amount due at closing at this ridiculously high number, and the other lender is showing something really low. So the, the lender that's showing it really low seems to have a leg up on the other lender. And that's the most ridiculous thing in the world because we just looked. They're basically the same, assuming no origination fee. That's the HOA. Who dictates the HOA? The Homeowners Association, not the lender. The homeowners association doesn't even communicate with the lender. They communicate with the attorney who is picked by the contract to tell us what we're supposed to do. So based on what we just talked about, how much of a difference from lender to lender to lender to lender, assuming no origination fee, will expenses at closing be different? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. And people will spend time trying to find out which lender is going to have the best deal here. That's not where it's at. Now, there are some things that can affect this a little bit. And as I said, if you're working with a lender who's creative with you, especially in the market we're in today because of appraisal gaps, there's things you can do on number one to make your offer look stronger. Now, that's also going to potentially affect number three.
If somebody says they were going to put 20% down, but they're putting in an appraisal gap, they don't have a lot more than that 20%, and they're going to need money for that appraisal gap, but they don't want to pay PMI, and they have high credit scores, I'm going to add one more prepaid item. Upfront PMI. If they're only going to put down 10 or 15 percent and they have high credit scores, I'll show them how they can make one single premium at closing and never pay monthly mortgage insurance. So now all of a sudden, because you've got a creative lender, they're working with you on the appraisal gap here, which changes the down payment amount that they can now use for that appraisal gap. And we want to keep them out of PMI, so we are going to propose the possibility of upfront PMI instead of paying monthly PMI. Now, don't answer this out loud, but how many people picking up the phone, calling an online lender from California or Utah or New York, are you going to be comfortable with dealing with that kind of a scenario? And don't answer that because we already know what the answer is. Okay? Today, it's always important you work with a good lender. Always. And I, I'd like, I hope that I'm a good lender. I hope so. But there are other good lenders, okay? I, I, I will admit that. But you have to make sure your borrower in a market like we're in today is working with you and someone who understands this so that people don't spend their time worrying about $500 difference in price or in cost when the real difference is, how do I make my offer the best possible offer that that seller is going to look at? Does that make sense? All right. Now, there's a ton more that we could talk about, but we'll probably do that next week. We break some of this down a little bit further. Any questions? All right. Thanks. Thank you.